Arrow's impossibility theorem is a mathematical proof that there's no such thing as a perfect voting system. Every voting system can either be manipulated, or else it's inherently unfair like a dictatorship, or else it's unreasonable in some other way. In this video, I'm going over Arrow's impossibility theorem, including some of the violations of these reasonable principles and ways that voting systems can be manipulated. I won't be going through the mathematics of errors and possibility theorem, I'm just giving an overview. So first we have to ask the question, what is a voting system? What do we even mean by that? And in economics, we like to talk about preferences and preference orderings. The fact that I like chocolate more than vanilla, more than strawberry, um, that's a preference ordering. It's pretty easy to think about in an individual context. A voting system is basically any way of aggregating people's preferences to come up with a group preference, to say the group prefers chocolate over vanilla over strawberry. So what are some examples of voting systems? Well, let's look. So examples of voting systems, um, people are used to majority rule, which might work well if there's only two candidates, but if there's three candidates, sometimes none of the three have a majority, all of them have below 50%. Um, so majority runoff is a system where you first vote on everybody and then you take the top two and run those off with a majority rule voting system. And then we have plurality rule, which is simply take one vote and whoever has the most votes wins, um, even if that number is below 50%. And then a board account vote is going to be a vote where you account for the strength of people's preferences by having them, if there's three candidates, give three points to their first candidate, two points to their second candidate, one point to their third candidate, maybe zero points to the last candidate if there's four. Um, so it people are sort of allowed to express um, express a full ranking with a board count vote. And of course you could do that with different weights. So instead of three, two, one, you could do six, two, one, or you could do six, five, one, um, in terms of the point allocations over people's rank orderings. So there's lots of different ways of aggregating preferences, and all of those are going to be voting systems. Arrows and Possibility Theorem looks at four different characteristics of a voting system, and proves mathematically that you can't have all four at once. First, there's independence of irrelevant alternatives. And this property means that you can't change the outcome of a vote by adding some candidate or some option that really was never a contender in the first place. The second voting system property that we want to have that's part of Arrow's Impossibility Theorem is Pareto Efficiency. And this property basically means if everybody in the whole system has a particular preference order, they all prefer chocolate over vanilla, then the group aggregating system should also prefer chocolate over vanilla. If that system then spit out vanilla over chocolate, um, we could make a Pareto improvement by switching that preference order. So this is a very reasonable property that you would want in any given voting system, and the fact that you can't have it along with these other properties is kind of ridiculous. The third property of a voting system that's part of Arrow's Impossibility Theorem is called unrestricted domain. And this means that we use everybody's preference orderings to come up with the collective preference, nobody's left out. And also, we don't use anything other than everybody's preferences. So if the voting system handled tiebreakers by giving higher weight to older members of the society, that would be a violation of unrestricted domain. That's taking something into account that isn't just people's preferences. And then the last voting system characteristic here is non-dictatorship. Some versions of Arrow's Impossibility Theorem will explain this by saying you can't have all of these other properties unless it's a dictatorship. And it's worth mentioning that there's different ways of describing Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. Some places will break this out into seven different properties, other places will use a more mathematical description of these same properties. So I'll put a link below to some different variations on how people describe the theorem. Let's go to the whiteboard to look at the violations of these properties, because that's going to get us into how can voting systems be manipulated. I'd like to show you how a violation of independence of irrelevant alternatives would work. 
And to do that, I'm going to use a Borda count vote. We're going to use the example of this family, and there's seven of them, and they're going to take a family vote about who should be um, their family's secret keeper and the person who is in charge of their property if, if all of them were to disappear, for example. So they have four candidates that they're voting on, and everybody has different preferences. So, for example, Ginny, um, her first choice is going to be Harry, and so with Bordeaux Count vote, we're, she's actually going to give three points to Harry. Um, her second choice is going to be Hermione, so she'll give two points to Hermione. Her third choice is Dumbledore, and um, her last choice is Fleur. So, Ginny's ballot would look like this. It accounts for her preference ordering in full. Um, and it turns out Ron has the same preference ordering as Ginny. And then Fred actually prefers Hermione. Hermione is his first choice. Um, his second choice is Dumbledore. His third choice is Fleur. And um, Fred has recently developed a distrust for Harry, so Harry is his last choice. So I'm going to fill in the table with everybody's voting. Okay, I need there to be seven people for this example, so I had to get rid of the dad. But that final column for be will be for us to tally up the votes. So how do you score the voting system? You simply add up the points given to each person. Okay, so in this voting system, we have a, a collective preference ordering, which is that the person with the most points is Dumbledore, second most points is Hermione, um, third most points is Harry, and so the collective order would look like this. So here we have the collective preference ordering of the family. But we notice that Fleur is an irrelevant alternative. She doesn't have many points, probably no matter what voting system we design, she can't really win. So if we were to kick her out of the race um, and re-vote, we would, we would, we're going to see how that might change the collective preference ordering. Let's try it. And just to make this simple, I'm simply going to let it be 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, in which case 3, 2, 1, so I'll change that to a 1, 3, 2, 1. And now I will score the new ballot now that we've eliminated Fleur as a possibility. So now that we've scored this, we have the new preference ordering. Harry is preferred to Hermione, is preferred to Dumbledore. That's exactly flipped from the old preference ordering when we had Fleur in the mix. So by adding or taking away Fleur's membership in this, this race, it completely turned around the preference ordering. So that makes this voting system very susceptible to manipulation. Um, so that's generally how independence of irrelevant alternatives works. It's a property that says we want to make sure our voting system isn't this um, manipulatable, this fragile to the addition or subtraction of new candidates. That's Arrow's impossibility theorem. It proves mathematically that any possible voting system you could come up with is going to violate at least one of those four really reasonable principles. So is this cause for despair? Um, well, maybe a little bit, but um, it's also worth mentioning that just because it violates one of these principles doesn't mean it always will. There's going to be lots of situations where um, the voting system works out extremely fairly. And it's also possible that our system can get better at predicting when there's a problem or figuring out when there's a problem with fairness. So um, having more minds working on voting system problems over time will probably help. And the first step of that, of course, is knowing errors and possibility theorem.